And good morning. And welcome to church again, and would like to welcome those who are now joining us on Facebook as well. We are on a journey, a journey through the Bible, and we have now come to the second major division of the Old Testament, the message of history. And today we'll be making our first stop in this division as we look at the book of Joshua this morning. And Joshua is a guide to victory. And so our scripture this morning will come from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, looking at verse 11. It sets the stage for us as we begin looking into this wonderful book. And he says, These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. And so we learn there that Joshua is not just about Joshua. It's about us, and that these things were written down for us, and so we'll begin looking at what we can discover in this tremendous book this morning. But beforehand, would you join me as we go to the Lord in prayer, asking for his guidance and direction in our study time. Lord, I come before you, and Lord, I begin by acknowledging my utter need for you. I ask for the anointing power of your spirit, for Lord, I know I cannot do this in the flesh. Lord, I ask that you would give the words that you would have to be spoken, and I ask, Lord, for your cleansing, that you'd make me a vessel that is clean and fit for your use. I pray, Lord, for each one that is listening. We ask and invite you to speak to our hearts through your Holy Spirit that we will hear what it is that we're needing to hear from you. So, Lord, we give ourselves up before you, inviting you to speak to us. And it's in that precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Do you remember the miracle on the Hudson? When U.S. Airways flight 1549, shortly after takeoff, struck a flight of birds. And Captain Solenberger had to ditch the plane in the Hudson River. And miraculously, no one was killed. No fatalities. Imagine it's the first aviation accident where there were no fatalities, and almost all of them are total fatalities. And so it was dubbed as the miracle on the Hudson. Sometime after that, Katie Couric was interviewing Sully, and so she asked him about that. And he said, for 42 years, I've been making small, regular deposits in the bank of experience, education, and training. And on January the 15th, the balance was sufficient so that I can make a very large withdrawal. When we come to the book of Joshua, it's about another leader who has been training for 40 years for the task that the Lord has for him. And the message of this book is designed to help us, those of us who are disciples of Jesus, to help us to stand strong, in the battle of temptation and as we battle against the spiritual forces of darkness. And so the book of Joshua is a guide to victory. And so I think for any of us who are disciples and we want to live a victorious life, the book of Joshua is certainly one that has a lot that it can say to us. And it reminds us that we are to be righteous and courageous as we face the pressures to conform to the world around us and the hostility when we don't conform. And so Joshua begins with Israel's entrance into the promised land, the land of Cana. And then this section, it helps us answer questions like, how can we live victoriously? How can we move out of the wilderness of doubt and restless wondering 
into claiming the promised victory. And one of the first things that we encounter in Joshua to answer that question is a picture of what a spirit-filled life looks like. And victory begins with the right leader. You see, Joshua is to lead the people into victory. He is God's anointed leader. And it's no coincidence that Joshua and Jesus are the same name in Hebrew. You see, Joshua is a symbolic forerunner of Jesus. Because just as Joshua will lead the people of Israel into the promised land, Jesus is our spiritual leader who leads us into a spiritual victory. Just think about this. The Israelites were offered a promised land, a new life. And through Jesus, we have been offered the promise of a new life. And both are a gift. When God gave the promised land to the people of Israel, it wasn't because they had done anything to deserve it or earn it. And when Jesus Christ gives us eternal life, and abundant life and victory in this life. It's not because we have done anything to deserve it or earn it. It is a gift of God. And even though the land is going to be a gift for them, it requires for them to take possession of it. And the only way that they will be able to do that is through obedience and faith. In fact, God gave this promise to Joshua. I will give you every place you set your foot. Wow. Can you just imagine the spectrum of that promise? I will give you every place you set your foot. And that's exactly the same kind of promise that Jesus is giving to us. He says, you can have as much of me as you want. There's no limit to it. You can experience all of my presence that you want. You can experience all of my power in your life that you want. And so the life that we can live in Jesus is only as large as our imagination. It's only as long and as wide as we are willing to claim. But for the people of Israel, possessing the land will not be easy. The way to victory is going to be through the battlefield. And of course, our way to victory is going to be through spiritual warfare as well. But here's the good news. The results are guaranteed. The Lord made a promise to Joshua and he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Does that not sound familiar to the promise that Jesus made us? I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You see, Joshua is that picture of Jesus. Everything that they were offered is a picture of what God is offering us through Jesus Christ. And think of the implications of that. It means that every spiritual battle that we encounter, we can be victorious. It just blows the mind, doesn't it? To think that every spiritual battle, if I follow God's plan, I will be victorious. And as they're getting ready to go into the promised land, it is a frontier. And you know, when we take that new life in Jesus Christ, it's a frontier as well. It's exciting, and it's going to take courage. And it's not going to be a place of aimless wondering. And so God lets them know right up front, it will require commitment. And that's exactly what it is when we come to Jesus. We're making a commitment. 
You don't come to Jesus just for salvation. You come to Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. It's making that commitment to Him. And I want you to listen to the three things that God tells them they must do. The first thing He says is, be careful to obey all of the law. Don't turn from it. Obedience. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. And then the third thing he says is be careful to do everything written in it. You see, the message is really clear there. Victory is going to come by being in the Word of God and doing the Word of God. It's not enough just to be in it. But it's getting into God's Word and it's memorizing it and it's spending time with it. It says, he says, meditate on it day and night. And there we begin to discover that key to victory. And when we've meditated on it, then we do what it says. And after that, it's when the Lord says to Joshua, you will be prosperous and successful. Now after that we find the intriguing story of Rahab and the two spies. Joshua has sent them out to look over Jericho. And while they are there, their presence is detected because they are seen going into the house of a prostitute, Rahab. And it will turn out that she will actually save their lives and give them some of the greatest intel that they will pick up the whole time they are there because while in her home the men of the city come looking for these two spies and so Rahab takes them up on the roof of her home she hides them under flax that is on the roof drying and then she tells the men of the city that they left at dusk and then she gives them this wonderful bit of intelligence She told them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear has fallen on us. We are melting in fear because of you. Now listen to this. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites. When we heard it, our hearts melted For the Lord your God is God. Now think about this. How long have the Canaanites been living in fear? Forty years. Ever since Israel first arrived on the east side of the Jordan, 40 years ago, they have been melting in fear. It's really ironic, isn't it? Because if you remember the story when the Israelites first sent out the spies 40 years earlier, they came back and they gave a report of how strong the cities were and how powerful the people were. And they feared the inhabitants of the land. And so they refused to trust the Lord and take possession of the land. And they spent the last 40 years wandering in the wilderness when all along, The inhabitants of Cana were melting in fear of them. Now before we're too hard on them, it probably would be good for us to ask the question, what opportunities have I missed because I was fearful and refused to trust the Lord? Because that's exactly what they did. They had an opportunity 40 years ago. And they missed it. Because they were fearful and wouldn't trust the Lord. It makes us ask, how many years of my life have I wasted being fearful when I ought to have been trusting? And then after three days, the spies, they went into the hill country and then they returned and gave Joshua a full report. And they said, the Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All of the people are melting in fear because of us. 
And then three days after that, the Israelites prepare to go into the land. Three days. Three days before the spies return. Three days before Israel goes in to take up the land. That ought to have a familiar ring to it. It's to remind us of the resurrection. And it's the same resurrection power that is going to allow them to enter the promised land and to take it. And it's that resurrection power that makes us victorious over everything that threatens to defeat or hinder us. And yet there's still one more obstacle, one more barrier between Israel and the promised land. They're still on the east side of the Jordan. And so you have the Jordan River between them and Jericho. And the Jordan River is at flood stage. Now, the two accounts of the crossing of the Red Sea and the crossing of the Jordan are very similar. And they're both an image of baptism. In fact, you might remember we looked where Paul had said that when they crossed the Red Sea that they were baptized into Moses. And so both of those are to remind us of baptism. And baptism is a picture. It's a picture of death and resurrection. It's a picture of how we have been with Christ in His death. That we are identified in His death. That when Jesus died, He was paying our sin debt. And how we are identified with him in his resurrection. And so in that Red Sea we are identified in Christ's death. Because look at the picture. They've just been set free from bondage. And when you've been set free from that bondage and you come to know Jesus Christ. And your sin debt has been paid. You're to follow him in baptism. And that baptism says I am identified in his death. And now they are at the Jordan River. And it is a picture of how we are identified in the resurrection of Jesus. Because now they are getting ready to go into a new life. In a new land. And that's exactly what we experience when we come to know Jesus Christ. And it's moving into that life. And it's a life that comes to the end of self-reliance. And one that is trusting God to lead us into victory. You see, they crossed the Jordan and the Red Sea the same way, by obedience and faith. You might remember when they crossed the Red Sea, the water separated, and as far as we can tell in the Scriptures, you have two walls of water, and it takes faith and obedience to walk between two walls of water with nothing holding them back except the power of God. And when it comes to crossing the Jordan, it's at flood stage. And he says, the waters will dry up after you step in them. You see, it's a way of faith. It's a way of obedience. And he's saying that the faith that got you out of Egypt is the faith that's going to take you into the promised land. And the faith that brought you to Jesus Christ is the faith that's going to lead you to victory in Jesus. And then after they cross the Jordan, they set up two memorials. They stack 12 stones, one for each tribe, on the bank of the Jordan. And before the waters dried up, they stack 12 stones in the center. And it was a reminder for them that this is the place where we failed to trust God. And this is the place where our faith was renewed. It's amazing. So often that's exactly what we have to do. If we've broken faith in the Lord, usually we've got to come back to that same place. And that's where our faith is going to be renewed in Him. And just as they set up a memorial, we have a memorial to remind us as well as to what we have in our deliverance from bondage and our new life through faith in Jesus Christ. And we call it the Lord's Supper. It reminds us that His body was given for us and that His blood was poured out for the forgiveness of our sins so that we're set free from bondage and that we move into victory through Jesus Christ. And now they've crossed the Jordan and it's time 
for conquest. It's time to take the land. And we now come to a series of battles that are going to take place because that's the only way they will take the land. And while Jericho is the first visible obstacle, it's not the first hurdle that they're going to have to cross. In fact, it's at this point that the Lord tells them that there are three things that they're going to have to do before they go up to fight the enemy and before they can experience victory over the enemy. And the first thing that he tells them is that they must be circumcised. That's a picture of our commitment to God. It's a cutting off and casting aside of the flesh because you cannot experience spiritual victory through the power of the flesh. And God's telling them that the way they're going to experience victory isn't going to be just in what they do with the flesh. The second thing they were to do was to celebrate the Passover. It's quite unique here because there's something going on the first time they celebrated the Passover. Forty years earlier, when they had their escape from Egypt and they crossed the sea and they go into the wilderness, at that point God began feeding them with bread from heaven, manna. And he's told them after they celebrate this Passover, the manna will cease because now they're moving into the new land and a new life and they will live off of the produce of the land itself. And the third thing that has to take place is that there has to be a strategy for taking Jericho. And so Joshua withdraws from the camp. And he's suddenly confronted by a man with a drawn sword. And so Joshua asks him, are you for us or for our enemies? And he responds and he says, neither. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. I haven't come to take sides. I've come to take over. And then he basically says to Joshua, it's not your job to plan the strategy. The strategy is up to God. And then he lays out the plan. It's simple. And it requires faith and obedience. Now I want you to think about this. Imagine you're Joshua and you're hearing this is the plan. You're to go up to Jericho. And for six days you are to march around the city. You march around at one time and then you come back to camp. On the seventh day you're to go up to Jericho and you're to march around the city seven times. And then you're to give a long blast on the trumpet and a shout and the walls will come tumbling now we know the story it doesn't sound that unusual but if you've never known the story and if it's in your third place that's going to really sound kind of bizarre I mean it's almost as bizarre as walking through dry ground at the Red Sea but that's the plan for battle you see it's a battle that says it requires faith and obedience and so there's three other major obstacles they're going to have to overcome before the land is won. And they represent the same kind of problems that we must overcome in our walk of faith. And the first one is Jericho. Remember, this generation of desert nomads has probably never seen a city before. And Jericho is a walled up city. It's a fortress. It's a seemingly insurmountable obstacle. You see, Jericho represents those obstacles that baffle and mock us. It may be a battle in our life that's been mocking us for years that you'll never be victorious over me or some habit that's constantly threatening our walk of faith. And look at the strategy for confronting that kind of a problem. You walk around it in the presence of the Lord. You give a shout of victory and the walls come down. 
Have you ever asked why God had them walk around Jericho for seven days? Why they walked around it seven times on the seventh day? What's going on here? What is it that God is doing? And I think what God wants them to see is that the real obstacle is not the problem. The real obstacle is our attitude towards the problem. If you see Jericho is insurmountable, it's not that Jericho is the problem. It's your attitude of seeing Jericho as insurmountable. And so God has them march for seven days to change their attitude. They're going to have plenty of time to look at Jericho and what they see is insurmountable. And they'll probably begin wondering, how in the world is God going to do anything about this? How will we ever take Jericho? But as they walk around those walls, it gives them time. Time to think. Time to think about what God has done. Time to think about what God can do. Time to see the walls as God would see them. Not to see this obstacle through human eyes, but to see it through divine eyes. And those walls are no problem for God. You hear the message? Whatever the problem is in your life that you think is so huge, see it through the eyes of God. It's not that big of a deal. We make it a big deal. But when we begin to see it through eyes of faith, it changes everything. And so by the seventh day, when they had been around that city seven times, they were ready to give a shout of victory. And the walls came down. Now the next obstacle is I. Now, I is really just an insignificant wide spot in the road. In fact, as they look over I, they decide, we don't even need the entire army to go up. There's just no reason to do that. We'll just send a few thousand soldiers up. They'll take care of I and the battle's done. And so they go up to confront I. And what happens is I routes Israel in battle and sends them running. Why? That was Joshua's question. In fact, he takes that question and he goes to the Lord. Why? What's going on here? And that's when he discovers that there is sin in the camp. And when you hear about the sin, it almost seems insignificant. When they were at Jericho, they were to take none of the spoils of war. It was all to be left dedicated to the Lord. One soldier, Achan. He saw a wedge of gold, and he was kind of aching for it. And he saw some nice clothes, and so he took those and he buried them in his tent. And the message becomes clear. Here's the problem. There's no such thing as insignificant sin. God wants them to get the message. When there is sin, there is going to be defeat. If you don't deal with it, you will be defeated. And so for us, that key to victory is defeating the internal enemy, the secret sin within. And then the third obstacle that they're going to encounter is revealed in two battles, at Gibeon and at Beth Horon. At Gibeon, the battle is deceit. Joshua is deceived there. And then at Beth Horon, he has to face a league of nations. Five kings come out against them. And both of those are a picture of how Satan wants to attack us. First, it's through deception, which takes us back to being in the Word of God. If we're not in the Word of God, Satan will deceive us. Because it's the only way that we will have the truth so that we're not deceived. And if we're not in the Word of God, then we live like the rest of the world around us and we begin thinking, well, we all have our own truth. And you know, that's what's scary. 
Because what we need is the truth of God. In fact, I don't give a flip about your truth and I don't give a flip about mine. What matters is what God has to say. And that's what will protect us when Satan attacks us by deception. And as we move closer and closer to the return of Christ, the Bible tells us that the deception is going to be growing. And so we have to have our minds ready and alert. And then the second thing that Satan does to attack us is by intimidation. For Joshua, it's a league of nations. For us, he will just try to overwhelm and intimidate us. And if we forget who's really fighting our battle, we can be intimidated. But if we remember that we're fighting in the power of the Lord, and it's in His strength, it doesn't really matter what Satan does. The Bible says he goes around as a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And when you know Jesus Christ, He's a toothless lion. He's making a lot of noise. And we should not be intimidated by him because we have resurrection power through Jesus Christ. And so Joshua stood firm. He stood in his faith and God worked a miracle. And then we come to the third division of the book. And it's on the division of the land. And this is really about the mopping up operations as they boldly take what God has promised to them. And it reminds us that there are probably some mopping up operations that are still needing to go on in our life. Details that are needing to be taken care of. Things that we may think are insignificant, and we've already talked about that, but we need to be dealing with that sin in our life. And then as we come to the conclusion of the book, it sets before us some of the perils and the dangers that we must guard against if we're to maintain a position of victory. And the first one is a misunderstood motives. The battles are over, and now the three tribes of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh are going back home, if you remember. They are occupying land on the east side of the Jordan. And so when they cross the Jordan to go home to their land, when they cross that river, they build a memorial there, an altar. And when the other tribes hear about it, they become indignant. They think that they're rebelling against the Lord, that they're setting up some kind of false idol to themselves. And so they prepare to go to war against them. And when they arrive, the three tribes are understandably upset. And then they explain that, no, this isn't an altar for another god. This is simply a memorial. This is a reminder, it's a monument to remind us that we are in covenant together with you. And what creates that covenant is our covenant with God. It does, it makes us wonder how many times we've jumped to the wrong conclusion when we try to accuse someone's motives of being wrong. And just with them, it brings division. The second peril is that of incomplete obedience. The entire land has been given to the people of Israel. And yet they left some portions of it unconquered. It just seemed to be more trouble than it was worth. And that proved to be a tragic mistake. And it reminds us of how dangerous it is to leave part of our life unconquered. To fail to finish what it is that God has called us to be. To think I have come so far and that's good enough. But striving for what God has called us to be in Him. And finishing what He's called us to do. And when we don't do that, it leaves us in a dangerous place. And the third peril is confidence and pride. 
Because if our confidence is in ourself, it is a false confidence. Joshua challenges the people. You probably have heard this challenge. If serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day who you will serve. And the people replied, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord, to serve other gods. We too will serve the Lord. And those are bold sounding words. And so Joshua confronts their pride. And he says, if you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will make an end of you. So what Joshua is doing is reminding them that they do not have it within themselves to do what it takes. And we do not have it within ourselves. We do not have the strength to stand by ourselves. Paul states it so well when he says, When I am weak, then I am strong. It sounds like an oxymoron, but what he is saying is when I realize how weak I am, then I depend upon the Lord and His strength. And it's that acknowledgement that the flesh is never enough. We never have enough within us to be victorious. But we have one who lives within us, who gives us everything we need. And the more we rely upon him, the more he gives us. And so Joshua is about victory. And it reminds us that we are victors in Christ. Paul would state it this way, we are more than conquerors. And so it's time that we, the church, live as victorious people. Let's pray together. Lord, we come before you and we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you that these things that were written in Joshua were written for us. That we can claim and experience the victory that we have through our commander and Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his precious name that we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand.